Very good to see you. That was very generous. Thank you. Welcome to COGX, Mustafa. How are you? Great. I'm doing well. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Congratulations. Thank um, you. And, and by the way, thank you uh, to um, Mustafa for agreeing to sign some books afterwards. We'll tell you how uh, that all works as well. The coming wave. Are we surfing? Are we fleeing? <laughs> it's a good question. Maybe a bit of both. I think there's plenty to surf, and that should be the main objective. You know, to, over the next couple of decades, I think we're going to unleash a productivity boom unlike anything we've ever seen. You know, intelligence is the thing that has made us productive as a species. It has been central to the creation of peace and prosperity. It has lifted billions of people out of poverty. And we're about to make intelligence a cheap and widely available resource. Imagine everybody, regardless of your background, your education, your wealth, your privilege, mm -hmm. having access to the smartest tutor, you know, the best doctor, the best accountant, lawyer, project manager, decision maker. And I think that's going to completely change the way that society works in the next 20 years. So as you set that scene, I'm hearing not a thousand, but a million flowers blooming. Throw off the safety catches. I know what's in these pages is not so fast. You're expressing some caution too. You know, I think that any transformation, and when you look back through history, feels super scary at the beginning, right? The unknown is always destabilizing. There's an, a, an amazing story that I found about the time when the railway first arrived in the UK, in Liverpool, at the celebration ceremony of the first train. The Prime Minister of the UK and the Member of Parliament for Liverpool were standing on the tracks when the train first headed towards them, and the celebration party was actually, several people in the celebration party were killed. Oh, gosh. Because they didn't understand the idea that this huge thing was going to move towards them and, and not stop. And it, it's a kind of a strange anecdote, but it just gives you a, an insight into how, how unbelievably strange things appear yes. at first. You hear the birth of motion picture, people leaping out of the way of the oncoming locomotive. Right, or struggling with escalators and so on. You know? so, and then almost instantly we adapt and we adjust. Yeah. And that's been the great thing about the last year, right? We realized that, you know, AI isn't as scary as we might have thought three years ago when everybody was talking about Terminators. AI makes loads of mistakes. It's sometimes very prone to biases. It has lots of weaknesses. Mm. And the more you experiment with it and play with it and, you know, basically enjoy being creative with this new clay, the sooner we get to control it and shape it in right. ways that and, are good for us. And, and involving everybody, right? So, so, so we'll take questions on the coming wave, everything, but also very briefly, remind us of that core mission. You could be sitting around a kidney-shaped pool sipping cocktails. You started Inflection AI for a specific reason. I wonder what it was. You know, I, I believe that in the future, everybody is going to have a personal intelligence, right? So if this AI revolution really is like the arrival of apps on everyone's phone or websites or the internet, you know, people have compared it to all kinds of things, then roll forward 10 years and every organization, every government, every charity, every business, you know, every individual musician, artist, maker, creator is going to be in some sense represented by an AI, right? There are going to be AIs everywhere. Mm. And so I think that everybody will want a personal intelligence, one that is aligned to your interests, on your team, in your corner, has a fiduciary connection to you. And I think that will be super important when it comes to the business model, because, you know, you wouldn't want <clears throat> somebody else paying you know, the wages of your lawyer or your mm -hmm. doctor or your accountant. You want that person on your team and Absolutely. you want those incentives aligned. And so that's what I'm setting out to create with Inflection. And I hope that Pi will be exactly that for you, your personal AI. Yeah, so, so that is an inspiring and bold uh, vision. I'm going to open it um, right, right up now, as I promised. I'm going to do it in zones um, over here. And I, I see it very clearly, but I'm going to go just to our guest in black. Say who you are uh, if you'd like, but you don't have to, please. Hi, Mustafa. Uh, my name's Lindsay. Um, I'm loving the whole, uh, you know, festival here today uh, over the last couple of days. Lots of talk about what AI can do to advance humanity. Um, and uh, in your last talk, you mentioned about how you've kind of built Pi to be non-judgmental, which is amazing. Um, but on the other hand, what is the role, do you think, uh, of educating humanity to be better? So when you say they're non-judgmental, I think you use the example of racism. 
Um, how should AI actually instill anti-racism so that we actually do get to a more di diverse and better humanity? Yeah, I, I, look, I think that's a great question. I mean, a couple of years ago, maybe say three years ago, we said, oh, AI is never going to be creative. That'll be the preserve of humans. And then a few years after that, we said, well, you know, humans are always going to have you know, empathy as a sort of discrete set of skills that were very distinctly human. And I, th I think that kind of framing has always been wrong. We've now demonstrated that AIs really can demonstrate empathy. I mean, Pi is completely different to ChatGPT. If you ask ChatGPT for support because you're feeling anxious, it'll very robotically give you a list of, you know, go take a shower or go for a run or, you know, have you tried, you know, you're talking to a therapist or something. It's a very, you know, structured list, whereas Pi is designed to be kind and supportive and super respectful and very fluent, but also very boundaried. You know, it's very clear that it's not a human and it is an AI, and that's distinct and, and separate from you. And it, and it has, you know, to some extent, a set of values which sometimes you may disagree with. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes it might be an opportunity for you to reflect your values into Pi. Like, let's say that you want, you have a goal of losing weight, right, or becoming a better public speaker, or getting better at, you know, making big decisions, making important decisions. Like, Pi is going to be a coach enabling you to mm -hmm. be better, and so. You framing Pi so that fr Pi can frame you is, I think, what the dynamic will be. Okay, and on that personalization, somebody says, I don't want my PT instructor or rowing coach to be kind and cuddly. I want it to talk to me in this way. <laughs> will you sanction a different form of communication? We know what kind of Pi you would like. I see. <laughs> Pay good money for that. <laughs> David, it's a serious point. We it's like it's to be totally commu true. Personal communication is very, it's, it's very personal how we like to be communicated with. And I think that these are going to be the difficult decisions that we all have to make over the next few decades in terms of what the boundaries are with AIs. Because oh. you also wouldn't want... And I, I don't believe in a hyper-personalized AI that will do exactly what you say and simulate any kind of you know, activity or style that you want. So there will be some boundaries. And okay. different AI developers will, de will, will build AIs with, you know, that operate within different limits. Understood. We're going to go this zone over here. And I'm just going to go here. Second row from the back in the white shirt. Yes, that's very helpful. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Ali. I'm a data scientist. And uh, my question is thinking beyond by something like that. And I, would, I always have that thought of having a personal assistant where it does know my heart rate, it does know my biomedical things, it does know what I ate, and so to some extent does know what I feel. And I, I would love to think about how far we are, we are from something like that where it does know me and what I do in my life and can do personal recommendations, what I learn, what I study. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if I have a goal, that have much more rich information. I'm, I'm thinking about some sort of sensors, but on the same time, really. Yeah, I mean, I think we've got to the point where AI is almost overhyped short term, but perhaps like it's underappreciated the extent to which it's going to change society longer term, so over 20 years. Like, like short term, I think everybody suddenly thinks everything is instantly possible. And I think the trajectory we've been on is has been quite predictable and it has been pretty pretty radical but you know there's what you described is the integration of many different modalities of data like heart rate sensor data or image data maybe looking at your past email looking at your location that synthesis of many types of modalities i, I think is mm. tough it's not so i don't think that's happening in the next so two or three years so to what extent will pi be connected to your body i think well eventually it i think eventually it will i mean i think people will want to have you know your personal AI have visibility of you know most things and you know there'll be boundaries and control but I think okay. many people will choose to give it access. All right, let's have another. I see this middle zone here. Why don't we go um, just second row here and then I'll do another one in this block here. Thank you. In the jacket and the white shirt. Thank you. Two of my friends are trying to create avatars for celebrities simply because they can't respond to social media posts quickly enough. It's very brave to consider such a thing, but with your advice, um, what would you suggest they do? Mm. How should they build it? And Gosh. do you think it's viable? With the celebrity's consent. <coughs> of, of course, the yes. celebrity would right. be driving. Right, all right. Yeah, no, I, I think that we are actually very close on, on this one. I mean, I, I think that especially with consent, we're going to be able to create models that are that really capture 
you know, not just the key phrases, like the stock expressions, but the essence of what it is to be Beyonce or Will I Am. And I know that those are, you know, they're all working on those kind of projects. So I, I'm pretty sure that that is, we'll, we'll see that in the next couple of years. Mm, interesting. Very good advice. All right. And how about just in the pink, as it were? Thank you very much. Hi, Ollie. Hi. I'm Margaret McCabe, CEO and founder of DebateMate. I was recently on a platform with Sam Altman. I have set up and run a really revolutionary education program called DebateMate. My objective is to end child poverty. We're doing that in a really unusual way. We're now um, building the AI models that can do that. And Sam did confirm that uh, going forward, that people who write programs have to have the skills we teach, and that's you know communication, empathy, um, the ability to think fast on your feet, resilience, these, these human skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we are now putting together an A team to build our AI. All right, it feels like an invitation coming up, Margaret. No, sounds, I'm just saying, like do you... need pie do, on your team. Well, I was going to say, do you, do you look for those skills in the people who write your Good. programs? Yeah, without question. I mean, I, I, I think that we've deliberately created a very diverse team. We have therapists, psychologists, we have behavioral you know, therapists and so on, so on our team. And... I think it's great that you're doing that work. It's we, we, we've actually developed the algorithm that can see if people have got those skills before that you take them on. Oh, That's know. great. Now we, we can go down wormholes on all of this. I'm going to go. I'm going to go different zone. If you're over, yeah, I see you just out there with your hand up stretched. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, and I, I, I'm not ignoring you here, but thank you. I'm going to range it around, please. Hi, um, my name's Trish. Um, I'm a KDB developer, um, and. I'm a recent graduate, and I I have a very optimistic view about AI, and I'm I'm glad that you agree with me in your talks. But I question what you said about fiduciary responsibility because I think that I I, I don't know I have a view that because something can be free, it being free doesn't mean it's of less value to me. It, me paying money for something, yes, it in some aspects means that I do value it more, but I don't think that that holds with the technology that is open source that I can you know, work on myself. Okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't, and I don't it's want to misunderstand what it's you a, said. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think that open source, obviously, to some extent, will be free. I mean, you know, I, I, I would imagine that you're, even if you do use an open source model, you're probably going to be using it via a provider that runs the API, and so you'll be paying them. And my point with it about being free is that if you just use things that are free, then you have to ask yourself, you know, who, who is actually funding that business model and what are the incentives that drive that pattern? And I agree it's tough getting people to actually pay for stuff because we've been so cultured into expecting everything to be free as a service online. But that's a thing that really ha has to change. And I think it will when people start to see the immense power of these models. Lots of hands. Must have a, help me out here. Where should we go now? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the middle here in the white shirt? I'm Mariam. I'm a surgical trainee working for the NHS. Great. Now, I was thinking about the fact that we use robotics and we basically control them at the moment. My first question is, how far away are we from like uploading a CT of a patient and then the robot doing the operation. Mm. And the second thing is, have you thought about regulations for clinical trials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if only. I mean, I think on the robotic side, I'm sort of a little bit sort of pessimistic that it's going to have near-term impact. I mean, it's, it's easier to have impact in software because you can, you know, naturally it's not constrained by the physical world. Um, there have been some amazing papers published in the last five years, on, you know, nature quality papers on clinical interventions for diagnoses in mammograms, in cancer, in OCT scans, you know, and, and I, I expect that to start having clinical impact today. I mean, when I was at DeepMind, we published a nature paper to predict acute kidney injury and sepsis, um, you know, in seconds rather than hours as accurately as the best clinicians in hospital at any moment. So the challenge is going from research to practical implementation and you know the regulatory pain is 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 real. So it's sad because we have there's this like technological overhangs. Like we've invented things which clearly reduce costs, 
which save lives, which save time, and they're not getting deployed into production, particularly in the NHS. And I think that we need a more risk-averse culture um, because there's value to be had that makes you know, everything better. So. Yeah, I've had, I've had lots of chats with them over the years. <laughs> Why don't we just do very briefly, I see, an, was it an ethics question coming from you? So, right, we'll go ethics question in the front here, uh, and, th and then we'll go here in the, in, in the white top. Quick, quick fire. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom takes you aside. Mustafa, when it comes to the... This is quick fire, just break it up. Okay. <laughs> the Prime Minister says, Mustafa, the coming wave, the UK, what on earth is your top piece of advice to me as the PM? Hire technical people in your staff. Like, how can there not be an engineering cabinet? How, how, how does that make sense? I mean, you know, where... where, where? That's, that's a cabinet. He's first among equals. They're not his staff. You're talking about the, the civil service? Every major department and every government body has to have a CTO. Thanks. Okay. I just think that's... You, you asked for a quick fire answer. Yeah, that's good. So, so. First front row. <laughs> Thank you, Mike Butcher. Uh, <laughs> I recognize that voice anywhere. <laughs> right. yeah. So, um, I am Krishna Machandra. I'm from Singapore. Hello. Uh, for my sins, I was a lawyer for 25 years, so I completely agree that you're going to get um, legal avatars. I've been working on mine myself, making it free. But anyway, <laughs> uh, that aside, you know, you've all mentioned yesterday that it's alien AI, but if you look at the genesis of the whole data sets, it's all based on human uh, humanity, right? And the last, let's say, a thousand years. So the segue into ethics is, what is ethics? You know, the orthodoxy of ethics. I mean, if you look at, from a legal professional standpoint, we have law and ethics. In some countries, you're not allowed to charge fees if you don't win. In some countries, you're allowed to, Yeah. right? I don't know. I mean, look, look. I, I'm I'm good friends with Yuval. He's you know endorsed my book, but I you know he always says this alien thing, and I, I it makes no sense to me, and I always disagree with him about it. I, I think it's an unhelpful framing. It sounds like this scary invasion from a different planet that's completely out of control that's going to come and dominate us. To me, ethics is about governance and control. It's about oversight. It's about practical mechanisms for making sure that our shared values are reflected in the technologies that are around us. I mean, that's just the simplest way to express it. Yeah, no, thank you. We're going to pile more, and I promise, to the white top, and then I'm looking right to the back row. Thank you, but I notice a lot of demand here. Thanks very much. Um, Mustafa, uh, I met you at Stanford, actually, where you gave a great talk uh, uh, to Eric Brynjolfsson's class. Oh, yeah. And uh, one of the things we talked about there was how this is fundamentally different. The tech up yeah. until now has only augmented us and now is going to potentially replace us. I wonder if you've done more thinking around how the state can capture some value from that. I might add I am an AI optimist, but I'm slightly worried about structural unemployment it, in the coming It's decades. not going to replace us. I mean, the, 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 that would be a choice. Right? So to the point about ethics and governance, it would be a choice to design autonomy into the systems. It would be a choice to design recursive self-improvement into these systems. It would be a choice to let them define their own objective function or acquire more resources independently of us. Those are choices, they're decisions that we would make as engineers and creators that would be a failure of society to provide oversight on something like that. So I think the framing that this is inevitably going to replace us is, is just not correct. Nothing is inevitable. It's not out of our control. I feel like there's this like just loss of confidence in ourselves. Like there's this apathy. This well, like Mustafa, you know better than anyone that there are whole industries that exist through making organizations leaner by saying goodbye to huge tranches of a workforce to drive profitability. You seem quite confident in your prediction that what our speakers suggested isn't going to happen. Well, it, it depends what you mean by replace, right? So, you know, yes, it's going to make us more efficient in the workplace. Many of our existing roles will change, and that's a good thing. I mean, creative destruction is the engine of progress, and we want to encourage that. We want to accelerate that. But replacing us as a species, I mean, maybe I was connecting it to the alien point, right? It's not going to come in and, like, you know, eradicate us. It's, it's a tool that we control, and we, ha we have rate-limiting, friction-inducing controls that, does, that, that, that we can use mm. to govern the way it interacts in our world. What do you think world. of that thought of AI leadership? Could you be led by an AI? Well, I mean, I think I will design an, uh, so a piece of technology in general, a piece of software and a tool, it's something that we design 
that in, in some sense does lead us, right? It enables us, it frames the choice yes. architecture of what's possible, it nudges us in directions. And of course, AI is going to do that, right? It's going to interact with me to shape my culture and my values. But yes. that loop doesn't necessarily have to be closed. It needs to be exposed to audit and oversight mm -hmm. so we can observe what are the changes that are happening in our world as a result of these interactions. I, I want more time, but we have three minutes. Uh, I promise the right on the back row with our hand upstretched. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Hi, Mustafa. Um, Hi. My name's Kendall Palmer. I'm the CEO of Untapped AI, and I'm a behavioral scientist, and we've been working for about nine years untapping human capability, coaching using human and AI. And I love what you've done with Hey Pie. It's absolutely brilliant. My question to you is how do you partner with companies like us that have got experience, I suppose, you can see the empathy, you can see how it's kinder and, and wants to help people, but part of behavioral change is about be, helping people be accountable yeah. and helping people Helping be challenging. Uh, it's a great point. Need challenging. It's a great point. So the, I, I, the in our internal strap line is moving from attention to intention. We're trying to reduce the tools in the world that grab our attention, distract us, trigger us, you know, in outrage, outrageous ways. And we're trying to shift it towards you being able to articulate your intention. What are the goals that you want to get done in the world? At the moment, the models don't enable that kind of long-term goal setting, right? But they will. In the next few orders of magnitude, when we train these models, you know, 10, 100, 1,000x, we're going to get planning, step-by-step -step planning. And that will allow for this kind of thing. So we don't make an API available, but you can email me if you want, Mustafa at inflection.ai. People pleaser. Yeah, that, that is uh, that's a, I agree generous. That. Thank you, dear. Great question. Very patient in the second row here in a greyish shirt. And my apologies to those I have not woven in. But we are in our final minute and a half. Pithy as you can. Um, really appreciate that you're democratizing intelligence and enabling people to get access to that. What is going to prevent there being a different level of intelligence accessible to someone? on the Cali road versus the King's road. <laughs> so today, everybody in this room, and in fact, everybody in the more developed world, broadly has access to the same super high quality hardware, right? We have the same smartphone, we have the same laptop, within some subtle delta, but roughly speaking, the top 20% of people on the planet have equal access to the best hardware man has ever invented, regardless of whether you're a billionaire or you earn minimum wage. That is an incredible story for meritocracy. So going back to what I was saying earlier, we should praise the things that society is getting right and try to like uncover the motivations there. Why has that happened? How has that happened? How can it be so good and we just take it for granted? That's amazing. We're on the same trajectory with respect to access to intelligence. It is going to be cheap and widely available to everyone. I don't see any incentive that is going to force is going to drive access just to the privileged elite few. I mean, look at the state of open source. It's incredible. You know, open source is just 18 months, maybe two years, behind the absolute cutting edge where models are costing mm. almost $100 million. That's an incredible story of meritoc meritocracy. Now, when the clock starts flashing red, I know what it means. Um, Cog X guess, would you agree this has been an absolutely fascinating session? Um, Thank you.